Welcome to Voices of Global Freedom Radio. We are broadcasting from San Diego, California, Saturday, April 11, 2015. This is Backpack and our co-host Yoda. We bring our patriotic conservative audience news you can use and actionable tactics, methods, and strategies to survive and thrive in these dangerous, troubled times. We are proud to be syndicated with the popular radio networks, the Spark Radio Network, K98 Talk, Leading Edge Radio Network, and we are among the top five news picks on Top Talk Radio, along with Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, and other household names. Today, I am honored and privileged to be editor-at-large of the multi-million circulated magazine, MagnifiedView.com, and honored and proud to announce that today is the five-year anniversary of the magazine. How are you doing, Yoda? If we were any better backpack, we'd have to take something for it. Celebration time come on with the fifth-year anniversary today. Five years ago today, I was sitting in a recliner. I was cooking out a herniated disc, a vertebrae. It had gone wild. I had been sitting there watching military channels on television and Victory at Sea, and the woman of my life named Jana Rama came over, and on a platinum platter, she had conceived the idea, took it to a concept, and fully made out the wonderful magazine that's become known worldwide as the MagnifiedView.com. <clears throat> we bring analysis and news people can use. As you said, Backpack, helpful hints, tactics, methods to survive and thrive. So while I was feeling sorry for myself in, in my recliner, my genius VA physicians and surgeons told me not to go near spine surgery. Over she came with the full magnified view dot com. Chanorama, currently founding, still editor in chief, runs us with a firm hand. Fifth year anniversaries are celebrated with wood. You know that back then? <laughs> That's right. Wood is a major part of this. Well, she runs around with a nightstick. She, <laughs> she keeps us in line both with the magazine and Voices of Global Freedom. So along with her viewers, her circulation, her visitors to the magazine, we want to thank Jenna Rama. In addition, her super son Don and gorgeous wife Sandra have contributed mightily to that magazine. Like our radio show, it's exceeded our wildest aspirations. So an applause here for Jana Rama, Editor-in-Chief, if you will. With that, how's our guest today? You got him on? Yes, we're honored and privileged to have the Executive, produ uh, executive Director of the United States Justice Foundation, Michael Connolly. He's a veteran, and he's been speaking all around our beautiful country uh, from the great state of Texas. Uh, he's done numerous shows, and he has his own radio show called Our Constitution. He's uh, written numerous books, and he is a staunch defender of our Constitution. How are you, Mr. Connolly? I'm just fine. Thank you for having me on. Well, thank you. Welcome to our show. Uh, what are some of the key, uh, from your background, how did you end up getting into being, becoming a constitutional lawyer? Well, first of all, let me congratulate you guys on the magazine. I've, I've looked at it, and it's absolutely a tremendous piece of work. And congratulations on being five years old. But I got into constitutional law basically uh, from the time I was in law school on. And I uh, really enjoyed doing it. I couldn't make a living at it back then. But I did get involved with the United States Justice Foundation, forming uh, it back in 36 years ago. And it was a California corporation, and Gary Creek was the executive director. And so we set it up out in California. I couldn't be on the board since I was a California resident, but I did a lot of work for the foundation. Three years ago, the uh, Gary Creek got elected judge in San Diego County. And they asked me if I would take over. 
And I said, only and if I, I didn't have to leave, leave Texas and move to California. And they said, I, that was fine. I could operate from, from Texas. So I had been working on constitutional issues for years and years. I've done some briefs in the United States Supreme Court. And that's what we do, basically, with the Justice Foundation, is we, we file briefs in support of other organizations, in support of cases that we're handling. We've done three or four briefs just in the last couple of months in the United States Supreme Court, including one in defense of marriage, traditional marriage. Uh, we represent individuals free of charge when they have constitutional concerns. Right now we're representing Justice Roy Moore of Alabama, the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, because he is uh, under the fire of the gun right now. You know, He defended the Ten Commandments when they wanted to remove it from the courthouses, and then when the Traditional Marriage Act of Alabama, which defines marriage between a man and a woman, was struck down, Justice Moore told the people of Alabama, or the clerks of court and the judges, they did not have to issue marriage certificates to gay couples. They violated the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. Well, he's being sued individually now by some gay and lesbian groups. And the state of Alabama, under their constitution, can't really defend him. He dare to defend himself. So we have stepped in and volunteered our services, and we are assisting his attorneys, and we're representing him. So that's some of the things we're doing right now. We have heavy involvement in veterans' cases, uh, because those are very, very great concern to me. I am a veteran. One of my books is about my father's unit during World War II called The Mortarman, which has become a bestseller on Amazon. Then I have two sons currently in, in the Army. The oldest boy has done a total of 94 months in combat since 9-11. Wow. 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 Almost eight years. And he's a major in the Army. His specialty is hunting down IEDs and either defusing them so they can study them or detonating them. And he's been teaching soldiers from all over the world to do this. My youngest boy is a Blackhawk pilot. And he's actually based out of Louisiana right now, working with Louisiana National Guard. Unfortunately, he's had a tough time of it recently because those four Louisiana Guard members that were killed a couple of weeks ago were all in his unit and all friends of his. So I was also commander of the American Legion Post in Carrollton, Texas, for two years. And I have many, many veteran friends. And what's happening with our veterans right now is just unconscionable. They're being hammered, and we're representing veterans around the country for free. And uh, we don't charge them or their families anything for the work we do. My word, Counselor, proud of you. Where is your explosive ordinance demolition sound station? Well, right now he's got a command in the National Guard out in uh, Arizona, but... Uh, He's about to be sent back overseas. Uh, he's going to be going to Germany uh, and uh, working with the Corps of Engineers over there. I did a lot of Germany, both in and out of the service. Well, good for him, and what a proud father you must be, huh? My word. Good on you. We're a veteran we're a veteran-oriented show, Counselor. A lot of our listeners are veterans. We know a lot of people. I'm older than a rock. I'm 77. And we've met a lot of, made a lot of friends along the way with mutual professional accomplishments. After the show, I'll contact you, and I'd like to share a bunch of our friends and people with you. They can help your cause. How do you afford well, me, all this? What pays for all this? Well, we raise our money independently. And uh, like I said, we don't charge our clients anything. We have a, we're a small organization. We have a small staff, uh, just a couple of full-time employees, me being one of them. And we don't get paid that much. I don't ask for that much. We try to spend our money on the cases. Uh, we hire attorneys around the country to write briefs for us and to do work for us on cases. And we have people support us by coming to our website at usjf.net and making donations either online or they can make donations by mailing them to either one of our offices in uh, California, Texas. And I, when I go around making speeches all over the country, a lot of people 
Uh, write me checks after write it was my speech, speech uh, particularly on the veterans uh, cases. Uh, and uh, I had somebody I had give me a check the other night for $3,500, and somebody else gave me a check just before that for 1000 But we're we're happy with $5 donations. So that, you know, as long as we can keep paying for the legal services that veterans and others need, uh, we're going to keep doing it. And uh, we have... For example, if there are veterans out there who need our help, and I'm, I'm going to explain in a minute what's, what the main thrust of our cases of veterans right now is, but if you need our help, contact me personally at Michael at USJF Mail. That's USJF, the United States Justice Foundation, USJFMail.net, or you can contact me through USJF.net, the website. Tell us but typical have, cases. Sorry, Counselor. Tell us typical cases, if you will. Well, right now, we, about two years ago, I broke the story on what was happening with the veterans and the VA and how they're being denied their Second Amendment rights and their Fifth Amendment rights and the Fourth Amendment rights. Uh, veterans are getting letters, and I've got copies of these letters, and I will send a copy of the letter to anybody who asks. Uh, so they can see exactly what these veterans are getting. And some of your listeners, you may have gotten the same letter. But basically the letter tells them that because of their physical or mental disabilities, they're going to be declared incompetent to handle their own financial affairs. And a fiduciary is going to be appointed to represent them. And the fiduciary will receive 5% of the veterans' benefits. This the fiduciary program has been around the VA for years and years, and it was designed to help elderly veterans who might be suffering from dementia. Unfortunately, when the Obama administration took over, they changed all kinds of things and started using this as a way to disarm American veterans. Because now, veterans are being declared incompetent for minor PTSD. If they have ever been depressed, even if they weren't treated for it, they have been depressed over a loss of a buddy in combat. Veterans are being declared incompetent because they let their spouses pay the family bills. We were representing a veteran here in Texas right now, and there are several other cases around the country we're working on with this same situation. Veterans are being told that they are incompetent to handle their own financial affairs because they allow their bills to be paid through an automated system at their banks. Now, on top of that, the letter goes on to say, excuse me, I've been making a lot of speeches this week, but uh, they're being told that once you're declared incompetent, you can no longer own, purchase, possess, or transport firearms or ammunition. If you do, you'll be guilty of a felony. They're losing their Second Amendment rights. They're being put on the NICS list, the National Institute Criminal Background Check list, that's run by the FBI, so they cannot legally purchase a firearm. When I first broke this story two years ago on my blog, we had a confirmed that there were 159,000 veterans on the NICS list. 99.9% of them did not belong. Now we understand that there's close to 200,000 on the NICS list. So this is an accelerating program. And veterans are, there's no due process here. Veterans are being given 60 days in this letter to prove their competency. Now, the burden of the Fifth Amendment is on the government to prove their incompetence. But that's not the way they're operating. They're telling the veterans, you have to prove you're competent. You have to do this at your own expense. And then if we still declare you incompetent, you can appeal. But here's the, the, what's happening with the appeal. Veterans are being told, if you file an appeal, if you exercise your constitutional rights, we will suspend the payment of your benefits. And you won't be able to feed your families. And some of these appeals are dragging on for two or three years. So what we're doing is we're taking over the appeals for these veterans. We're taking over for helping them prepare the letter before they have to appeal it. And we've, we've had some success uh, with some of the uh, veterans. But one of the problems they have is once they have been declared incompetent and put on the next list, even if we get the incompetency ruling reversed, the veterans are being told they're not going to be taken off the next list. They still can't purchase firearms. So we have a total violation of the Second Amendment rights of veterans and a total violation of the Fifth Amendment rights of veterans. As you would know, sir, this clown of a president 
once was quoted to say that veterans should pay for their own health care. When American Legion VFW squawked about this, he childishly remarked, well, they volunteered, didn't they? <laughs> anyway, I've, I've seen firsthand an example of your first case where a couple guys were totally competent. A friend of ours is an advocate, works for nothing. He got them payment for past service, you know, for disabilities. And they wanted to hand him off. But they wanted to hand a pair off so they wouldn't be able to handle their own money. Fortunately, our advocate beat them at that, and they got a couple good checks for the past and onward. Well, you're doing a hell of a job with it. I'm treated well, at the VA in La Jolla, where they've kept me vertical for a lot of years. I notice now every appointment, no matter who you're dealing with, they ask if you have a firearm. Inappropriately. Yeah, that, that, that's absolutely correct. And uh, we have some whistleblowers inside the VA. And one of them told me that that order to ask veterans about firearms originated in the White House and came directly to the VA from the White House shortly after Obama took over. And, but let me tell you, it's getting worse. If people think that all the things that are happening to your veterans can't happen to them if they're not a veteran, my fiance recently went on Medicare. She went to a new doctor who accepted Medicare to get it for her annual physical done. And the doctor, and I confirmed this with other people just the last couple of days, who had the same thing happen. The doctor apologized and said, we have a series of questions that we have to ask you, mandated by the federal government. And some of the questions were about the cognitive abilities and past medical history. But then the question came up, do you own a firearm? Yeah. She was, she was totally floored by this. But now it's happening to people that are on Medicare. Pretty soon it's going to be happening to everybody who goes to a doctor. And the veterans are just being hammered. We've got four confirmed censuses now, two of them here in Texas, where veterans went to the VA and – Several of them were there just to, to have their benefits reviewed. They went to the VA, and they were told that they had to take their clothes off so their bodies could be examined to see if they had radical tattoos. Uh, we weren't told what a radical tattoo is, but we suspect it's probably something like God bless America or don't tread on me. And they were told if they refused to submit to the examination, they would lose their benefits entirely. So the VA well, is using extortion. extortion. They are threatening our veterans. They are going behind their back, and they're putting them on the NICS list. Now, people need to understand about this NICS list, because the NICS list is designed to take people who've been convicted of felonies, put them on the list. People who are known drug abusers are put on the list. And the third category on that list are people who are mentally ill, have been adjudicated to be mentally ill to the point of being a danger to themselves or others. You know, adjudication in the law has always meant you have to have a hearing. The burden of proof is on the government to prove you're mentally ill. You have to have a hearing in front of a judge or at least an administrative judge. Barry Colder decided when he took over his just a, the Head of the Justice Department, our Attorney General, that adjudication now means that any veteran can be declared incompetent and mentally ill at any time by anybody who works for any federal agency, including private contractors. So whistleblowers at the VA have told me that the people that are handling this incompetency ruling are not psychiatrists, they're not psychologists, they're not even medical doctors. Many times they are nurse practitioners or they are just clerks in the VA. The In one area, one VA regional office we know of, and we're trying to confirm this and others, they use independent contractors who are poorly trained, who work from home, 
there's so there's no supervision. They're giving a file. They're told to declare a veteran incompetent, to send out the letters, declare him incompetent, and they are instructed not to talk to the veteran, and the veteran never knows who they are. So this is the, this is the way it's being done to our veterans, and this is why we are so busy with doing individual cases and are trying to raise the money to do a major class action lawsuit. And uh, the, that's going to cost probably a quarter of a million to a half a million dollars. So we're looking for some big donations to help us out on that. And you know we we just have to. But in the meantime, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We filed one suit of these against the VA already and won. Because they had, because uh, they had uh, refused to answer our Freedom of Information Act request, Information Act request and, we and we got some pretty valuable information from them. And now we're, we're and now thinking about filing a second suit, a second suit because we've because sent we've Freedom of Information Act requests request to yeah. VA, yeah. Department, yeah. Department of Homeland Security, yeah. Department of Justice, yeah. and specifically yeah. the, yeah. FBI, yeah. the FBI, and the yeah. Department yeah. of Defense. Yeah. Department of Defense. Yeah. And we had the, a we weird had situation developed with that that, that, that that your listeners need to know about. We had one of our media partners sign off on the four requests. From the VA, we wanted to know more about the fiduciary uh, program because we've just we just finished representing a, a 93-year-old World War II veteran who had somebody come to him at his home. Now, he was had he had throat cancer, and he couldn't get treated by the VA. So he was he was like on a six month waiting list. So he was using his benefit check to get his papers private treatment. An employee of the VA came to him and said, "We're going to declare you incompetent to handle your own financial affairs." This elderly veteran argued with him and said, "I'm I'm competent. I pay my bills on time." The VA representative says, "Well, I'm going to appoint myself as your fiduciary, but I'll let you go ahead and continue to write your checks." Well, then all of a sudden, well, the else, veteran doesn't the get a check. Get a check. For, five For five months, he doesn't get a check. He get a check. He's trying to track it down. His bank helps him. We're helping him. Finally, the, the Finally, the checks are tracked down because the VA claims to know nothing. It turns out that the checks are being sent to a bank account in another state in the name of the wife of the person in the VA who had himself appointed the managing fiduciary. So we filed these Freedom of Information Act requests from the VA wanting to know about the fiduciary program, who are they appointing, because we've heard it's big business now, that corporations out there are actually getting the money and handling the fiduciary as responsibilities, because 5% of a veteran's $2,800 a month check is pretty good, particularly when you're doing thousands of them. So we ask about that, and then the Department of Defense is appointing people or hiring people to declare not only veterans but also active duty, military personnel and National Guard personnel and reservists incompetent. And they get the similar letter, to from the, like the letter from the VA comes from this private contractor, but the veteran is only given five days in which to respond instead of 60. So we want to know from the Department of Defense about that and what they're doing there. We want to know from the Department of Homeland Security why veterans are being put on the top of the potential domestic terrorist list when, in fact, all the only reason they're on there is because they're veterans. And then, of course, we had the FBI. We're asking the FBI why they're refusing to take veterans off of the next list even when their incompetency ruling has been reversed. Well, we prepared all these. We sent them out by certified mail to all the agencies. And we heard nothing from anybody except from the Department of Homeland Security, which basically wrote us a stupid letter that said, we don't have any such list. And, of course, I've seen the list. It's on their website. And uh, they said, they said we don't have any such list. So after a while, I contacted uh, my media partner, and I said, look, send me the green card showing that these were all sent out by certified mail and received by the agency. Send me the originals of the letters. I actually prepared for them uh, the information we requested, but they put it on their letterhead. And I said, send that to back to me, and we'll look into filing suit. Well, he calls me two days later on Saturday morning and said he'd gone into the office to get this stuff for me, and the file was empty. The folder was totally empty, and the hard drives of the computers containing this information had all been erased. All the information was gone. He 
called the police. The police were baffled. There was no indication of a break-in, but only two people had keys to that office, him and his landlord. So he talked to somebody in Naval Intelligence, and, of course, I already knew what was going on here. And the guy in Naval Intelligence told him that this was a professionally done operation, that they had hit us deliberately, and so that nobody would know about it. And so, you know, we were, they were trying yeah, to intimidate we us. Now, I don't know which question we asked about the agency that changed this. But somebody very, very nervous. But if they thought they were going to intimidate us, they found out very quickly that that wasn't going to happen because we, the next day, stopped the request again. And now we're actually apparently they're, they're backing down because we're starting to get some answers. They're not sufficient answers, but we're getting some. Proud of you, sir. This is sinister. It's thorough beyond belief. A quick similar one. There's, we work with a lieutenant, retired police officer out of Vegas. He heads up a unit. They're trying to deny retired coppers and agents now being armed if they're out of the jurisdiction they worked in. This is thorough beyond belief. As you would know, sir, no government in history has ever aggressively disarmed its population without the desire of total arbitrary control of the people. It's hap- it's unbelievable. We're proud of you. Backpack, what were you saying? Uh, we're proud of you. We're going to take a short break. We're with uh, Michael Connolly, United States Justice Foundation, Voices of Global Freedom, Magnified View. <laughs> ImpactAnalytics.com. Good audience. Contact ImpactAnalytics.com. I say again, ImpactAnalytics.com. Look for their chief executive officer, Tim Kalin. I personally work with Tim in Beirut after the embassy bombing and the Marine barracks bombing. Tim has something for everybody on his website, particularly conservative, patriotic, everybody. Take a look at his website. Give Tim a call. Use Backpack and Yoda's name. Ask him about his email program. It can benefit you mightily. One more time, Tim Kalen, ImpactAnalytics.com. I thank you. Also check out PunchingBagPost.com, the latest Invention is a consortium of all the greatest conservative news from all around the Internet. We're back with Michael Connolly, United States Justice Foundation, and this is breaking news story that we're not hearing on mainstream media. Um, Mr. Connolly, why do you think that the mainstream isn't talking about this? Well, when I first broke the story a couple of years ago on my blog, uh, Drudge Report immediately picked it up, and I've been doing a lot of radio, talk radio shows. Uh, Fox News contacted me twice to be on their morning show. Unfortunately, both times I was not in a position to do so because they like to have you in a studio, and I was out in East Texas way away from a, a nearby studio. So, But right now they're, we're looking into getting some action on Fox News, and with other organizations, news organizations. Interestingly enough, NBC appointed a special producer to look into all of this, and then suddenly they just dropped it. Uh, we've taken under pressure from the White House. Right. You know that they they just dropped it. We never heard from heard from them again. So that's you know where we face where we face with the national news media for the most part is they do what the White House tells them. And we're talking. You know, we've talk, people are talking about White House scandals. This could be a scandal of epic proportions because we think the veterans are being targeted here specifically. And the reason is is that there are 23 million veterans in this country. We all took the same oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And by the way, that is the virtually same oath of office that Obama took, that Nancy Pelosi took, that Harry Reid took, yet they violated it almost on a daily basis. 
But we took that oath and we believe in it. We are trained to fight for our country. And uh, many of us are armed. Well, if you look at the history of dictatorships around the world, and, and zero in on, for example, Adolf Hitler. When Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, he was elected Chancellor by the German people. He wanted to become the all-powerful dictator. The first thing he did was to complete nationalization of the health care industry in Germany. He felt that if I could control access to health care, I could control the people. The second thing he did was begin to disarm the German people, starting with the veterans. Because the World War I veterans in Germany had taken an oath of office to defend their country's constitution and their country, not to defend that off Hitler. Well, the third thing that Hitler did was start to purge the military of high-ranking officers who were loyal to the country and to the Constitution and not personally to Adolf Hitler. We see Obama doing the same thing in our military right now. We see Obama even getting rid of captains and majors in the Army, high-ranking non-coms, and trying to replace a lot of these people by enlisting into the military illegals who, of course, have no particular loyalty to this country. They've already violated our laws by being here in the first place. So... Obama is following the pattern of Adolf Hitler, and they are targeting first the veterans to disarm us. And this is the thing that we're trying to get the American people to realize. Now, twice in the United States Senate, once in 2013, once in 2014, bills were introduced to stop this, called the Second Amendment, the Veterans Second Amendment Protection Act. Now, they uh, both were defeated. Obama opposed them. The Democrats, the Senate opposed them. Now the Republicans have control of the Senate, and a new bill has been introduced, but unfortunately it's extremely weak. It doesn't really protect the veterans. So we're trying to work with members of Congress to try to get the, this bill strengthened so that it can clearly help the veterans. If, of course, the problem is Obama's going to veto it yeah, the minute it hits his desk. So we think the best hope at this point is our continued representative of veterans from a legal standpoint, in the courts, fighting to, to get the veterans to, to the help they need, trying to get their, trying to keep them from being declared incompetent, getting the incompetency rulings reversed, and ultimately getting in front of the, the Supreme Court of the United States and having them rule that this is a clear violation of the Second Amendment rights of the veterans, the Fifth Amendment rights of the veterans, and the Fourth Amendment rights of the veterans. I was in the occupation of Germany, Counselor. I'm older than Iraq. And I spent 11 months living, working with German police. And it's exactly as you said. <clears throat> they had all been in the German army, of course, during the war. Many of them were military police. They were cops before the war, military police during the war, and again after the war. And I made many friends there living with them for 11 months. They described it, Hitler's act exactly as you just described it. You have lit up the board. Our emails are going to burn up our computer. Janorama, Editor-in-Chief, Magnified View and Voices of Global Freedom, indicates here that she's going to feature you and your cause on the magnified view. And if you will, she would like you to repeat your point of contact again, please. Okay, well, our website is usjf.net. That's for the United States Justice Foundation, usjf.net. And some of the articles I've written on the veterans issue are on that website. We're in the process of upgrading it. But if they go to the About Michael Connolly Executive Director section on the top of the, the website homepage, they can find the link to my blog. And they can read the articles I've written over the last two years about this and other subjects. If the veterans out there need to contact me, need representation, excuse me, they can go to USJF.net and do the contact information through there, do their email, or they can email me directly at Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, at USJFmail, 
mail dot net dot net. I want to say thank you to uh, our chat room is lighting up. We have the exceptional conservative show has logged in, and uh, you know feel free to send anything through the chat or call in six four six six five two four six six seven again six four six six five two four six six seven. We're excited to have exceptional conservative show uh, on our, in our chat room, and thank you. Um, so, Mr. Connolly, uh, all that you've been doing. Uh, what are some of the other examples that Obama has been destroying our Constitution? Well, he does it on a daily basis because he violates his oath of office. And by the way, the oath of office of the president says he should protect, preserve, and defend the Constitution of the United States to the best of his ability. The oath carries criminal penalties for violating it. And very few people realize this. But if you violate the oath of office, you can be you can be fined up to ten thousand dollars for each instance where you do it, and you can go to jail for up to a year. And this includes denigrating the Constitution or doing something to destroy our constitutional form of government. Well, the President of the United States has repeatedly said that he does not believe in the balance of power. He doesn't believe in the Bill of Rights, and he ignores them. Now, when he started office president, he started appointing czars to positions of power where they had their own budgets and their own agencies, essentially, and they operated in secret with no congressional oversight, and he appointed these people without consent of the Senate. The United States Constitution specifically says that the president, all presidential appointments must be approved by the United States Senate unless the U.S. Senate specifically says that they will they don't have to be approved in a specific instance. That was never done with the czars. He violated the Constitution then. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution sets up the powers of Congress. And by the, by the way, they are very limited. And, and uh, I point this out in a little book that I wrote that's become very popular, particularly among groups that are giving them out to students. It's called Our Constitution, same as the name of the radio show. And I take it. Each article and each section of the Constitution, I put them in there the way they were originally written, and then I point out by comments what they really mean. And I've had, for example, two PhDs contact me and say that until they read my booklet, they had no idea that the words separation of church and state were not in the Constitution. They had been told that in high school. They had been told that in college. Now they found out it's not there. But people, if they read this book, they will see what Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution does. It gives limited powers to the Congress of the United States. But then Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution says that the primary powers of the president and the duties of the president is to enforce the laws passed by Congress. It doesn't say he can decide which laws to enforce and which not to. It doesn't say he can he can decide to amend the laws on his own. And of course, with Obamacare, he's done that 47 times so far. It does, certainly doesn't say that he can make new laws. Yet, he's making laws on gun control. He's making laws about veterans. He is ignoring the amnesty laws on the book. And by the way, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution specifically gives Congress the sole power over naturalization and immigration. The President, nowhere in the Constitution, has given any power over that subject. Yet he has ignored the laws he's supposed to be enforcing. He's granted amnesty to millions of illegals. And now he's getting the government on the fast track of citizenship. And he's opening our border up for people to overrun it, including terrorists, potential terrorists, drug cartel members, gang members, all of which violates the Constitution and specifically violates the provision of the Constitution on treason, which said you commit treason against the United States of America if you provide aid and comfort to our enemies, allow our country to be... When our borders are stuck to our enemies... We're in the verge of making a deal with Iran that's going to be a disaster for us. We are presently providing aid to the enemy. In another area where we have to look at what Obama's done is any treaty signed by the president cannot be put into effect and enforced 
Until, until two thirds of the United States Senate United vote to ratify that treaty. We have the United Nations Small Arms Treaty. John Kerry signed it on behalf of Obama. The White House is basically saying that Obama can enforce that treaty. And by the way, part of that treaty requires national gun registration of all gun owners in the United States and that the names of all of us be turned over to the United Nations. We were told by Obama and John Kerry when they signed the treaty that that provision was not in there. I had read the original treaty, the original draft. I saw it in that draft. I saw it in the final draft, the one that was adopted. So that was an element of lie. But Obama, has, the White House is saying that Obama can enforce the treaty and without Senate approval, and that the only way the Senate can stop him is to two-thirds of them to step forward and vote and say he cannot do it. Exactly the opposite of what the Constitution says. Now we have this deal being made with Iran, and I'm as former military intelligence officer, I'm keeping a close eye on it. Excuse me, because it's extremely dangerous. The outline of it so far is basically will give Iran the nuclear a nuclear weapon within a year. Forget about the ten years that you're talking about. We're talking about within a year. And we don't know what they'll do with a nuclear weapon. They may attack Israel. Of course, they're going to have more than one, or they may give it to one of their clients, like Al Qaeda, to attack Israel. Or they may use it against the United States or against some place in Europe, or all of the above. And Obama is saying that that is an agreement that does not require ratification by the U.S. Senate. He doesn't even want the Senate to have any input in it. So the latest that is a violation of the Constitution. The latest polls that we've heard is that the Iranians and the Cubans love uh, Obama much more than the American people do. <laughs> so we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Michael Connolly, United States Justice Foundation. <laughs> Are you a commercial business looking to reduce costs on your energy bill? Replacing traditional light bulbs with LED results in tremendous savings every month. Commercial industrial manufacturing facilities from coast to coast are saving up to 90% on their skyrocketing cost of energy. Energy costs are rising every month. Using EE Pros lighting saves money, time, and will bring you happier employees and customers. (laughs) For a free audit and evaluation of your facility, Please contact or email Don Arrigo, president of EE Pros, at 480-585-9161, 480-585-9161. Tell Don that Backpack of Voices of Global Freedom Radio referred you. Yoda, have you had some experience with this? I have. I know of two instances where Don has saved a large parking lot in a hospital, another instance, eighty per, a stunning 80% of their energy bill. No hook in here. I think his worst problem is it sounds too good to be true, but it isn't. So, yeah, to save a whole bunch on your ever-increasing energy bill, Obama just pulled another one for some obscure, ludicrous, benefit 10 years from now to the environment. He's, his actions have begun raised energy costs tremendously. So, yeah, Don Arrigo, eepros.com. Thanks, for. Yeah, I say again, please go check out eepros.com, eepros.com. <laughs> We are back with constitutional lawyer expert on talking about the Constitution, Obama, and uh, continue with your thoughts on what's going on in America. Well, we're under a dictatorship at this point is what it boils down to. Obama has declared himself a dictator. He's refusing to abide by the Constitution and work with Congress on matters. Uh, He is passing laws on his own. He's using executive orders and executive actions to do things that violate the constitutional rights of Americans. 
And another thing that's in this booklet that I prepared on, called Our Constitution, it's getting a lot of attention, is I put in there the preamble to the Bill of Rights. Now, most people are familiar with the preamble to the Constitution. A lot of us had to learn it to repeat it to, when we were in school. But a lot of places don't even put in the preamble to the Bill of Rights. And if you read that carefully, it is basically the founding fathers warning the government that they're creating that these rights are given to us by our Creator. They are not rights given to us by the government, because if we acknowledge the government gave us rights, then we acknowledge they can take them away. And the Founding Fathers are telling the members of the federal government, you can't touch these. And we're talking about the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. And we're talking about the Second Amendment, right to keep and bear arms. The Fifth Amendment, right to due process. The Fourth Amendment, protections against illegal searches and seizures. Yet Obama's government continues to violate all of these. And he's not the first to violate constitutional rights. We've had it done in the past by other presidents and by Congress. But this is the first time we've ever had a president openly avow to destroy this country and openly try to destroy this country uh, and our constitutional republic. So people have to wake up, and I have on my blog at uh, michaelconnelly.jigsy.com, and again, they can access this through the USJF.net website. On my blog, I prepared last year formal articles of impeachment. And there are three articles with a lot of sub-articles pointing out how Obama has violated his oath of office and violated the Constitution and committed impeachable offenses. Now, when I first put this up, I posted an article almost two years ago called Impeachable Offenses on the Blog. It caught fire. Uh, Redflag.com has informed me that they've had 25 million views of that article. So we have a lot of people out there who are very excited about the possibility of impeaching Obama, and I give the reasons why, and I do this in a formal legal manner. All of these articles have been submitted to members of Congress, we have now confirmed that at least one member of Congress and possibly more in the House of Representatives have turned these articles over to the House Judiciary Committee for consideration. Here's our view on impeachment. It only takes a majority of the Congress to impeach the President of the United States. Then they have a full-scale trial in the Senate, and it will take two-thirds of the Senate to convict him and remove him from office. Now, with the current makeup of the Senate, that probably would not happen unless the Democrats feel so, so threatened by what is proven in this trial that they, they feel like they have to vote for his removal. But here's the reason we think this ought to be done. He's got two years now to continue the destruction of this country, and he's obviously going to do it. I mean, he's, he's talking about a new treaty, which he's not going to submit to the, the Congress, that will reduce the greenhouse emissions to the point where this country economically will virtually be destroyed. He's talking about instituting more gun control legislation than uh, right executive order. So we need to stop him or at least slow him down. If he is impeached by a majority of the House, the House can a point special prosecutors with extraordinary subpoena powers. They can go after the information that he has kept hidden. Things on Operation Fast and Furious, things on uh, about his other domestic policies, about the scandals he's been involved in, the IRS, Benghazi. They can cut through the red tape. They can cut through executive privilege. They can, for example, interview and even depose the survivors of Benghazi, who has been, have been hidden from us for two years now, from the American public and the news media. And they can present all this evidence in an open trial to the Senate, in front of the Senate, where the American people will be privy to what this man has done, along with the senators will be privy to what this man has done. If he's under an impeachment proceeding for violating his oath of office, for issuing illegal executive orders, then I think that he would be hard-pressed to continue doing so for the next two years while all of this is unfolding. I like it, right? Yeah. This is let me let me leap ahead with you with the proviso. We avoid conspiracies and the tin hat thing like the bubonic plague. So we stick with facts. <clears throat> We've got a investigative arm, seasoned operators only, 
some out of your branch of the service. They're multilingual from it, disciplines in mill intelligence, spec ops, investigative and medical stuff. There's a concern now from our insider insiders. These are genuine whistleblowers. Some are in place. Some have recently left the government. They're evincing indeed a concern that he's headed for martial law. What's your opinion about that, if any, Counsel? Well, I'm not any conspiracy theories either, and uh, never have been. But of course, there's an old saying: you're not not being paranoid. They really are out to get you. And uh, in this case, we have a man who <laughs> has openly shown his hatred of our Constitution, has openly shown his his contempt for the American military, for our veterans, and for our Constitution, and and. He has set up executive orders that would give him extraordinary powers if he declares martial law and basically allows him to declare martial law for various reasons. You know, any any, any crisis that he sees or perceives, he can declare martial law. I was reviewing this the other day uh, for a possible blog article because... He has issued so many executive orders and so-called executive actions. You have to go back and look at all of them and the way they've been put together. And all of them, for the most, well, many of them, for the most part, are designed to give the president power that the Constitution does not give him. Now, why is he doing that? Well, he either is in, envisions at some point there is going to be a crisis in this country, and it may be a terrorist attack from outside the country. It may be something that's just perceived as a, a terrorist attack. It may be a cyber attack instead of a physical attack. And at that point, he envisions himself or some other president in the future, preferably a Democrat in his eyes, Declaring martial, declaring martial law, and all of these powers are now given to him. Complete control of food, complete control of transportation, complete control of medical care, complete control of the allocation of energy. All of these he is now consolidated with illegal executive orders, because none of this has been passed by Congress. Congress has given certain powers to the president, but not the unlimited powers that we have under, under this president by executive order. So, yeah, I can see and envision, unfortunately, a situation where he will declare martial law, and at that point, the American people uh, will really have no choice but to fight. People smarter than I am, <clears throat> our insiders, agree with you totally. Backpack uncover in his role as editor at large of Janorama's Magnified View, uncovered a breaking, still developing series story on the Magnified View of jihadist training camps throughout the United States. It's currently the feature article under the masthead. Speak to that briefly, would you, Backpack? What you found out about that? Well, we have had numerous insiders and uh, journalists and many different shows that have brought to attention that uh, there are over 35, at least, terror camps. That's probably not even scratching the surface. Uh, there's a website devoted called terrorcamps.com. It's a magnifiedview.com and Top Talk Radio Strategic Alliance website that was put together to bring awareness to all these camps from sea to shining sea. Their corporate headquarters are in Islamburg, New York. We recently had Ryan Morrow with the Clarion Project who went there and found that they're, uh, they have dummies there. They're doing small arms training, and this is inside the United States. And now we're looking at 500,000 Syrians being brought back from uh, that are Obama's bringing in. And who God knows how many terrorists are coming over from that, that crew. Um, what are your thoughts, Yoda? Indeed, I'm interested in what our good guests is aware of, or how does Obama describe these terrorist training camps? Well, he uses that term, communal living. He tries to, <laughs> and we, when we had Ryan Morrow, he brought up too, and he's actually been on the side of making sure that uh, these terror camps are exposed for what they really are, not communal living. But the FBI, and they do this political correctness, is not allowed to 
open up a report against the terror camps because uh, you can't use the word Islam when you're opening up a report. In addition, Counselor, we've established that through some back door, he's bringing in half a million Syrians, sprinkling them, sprinkling them around the country. Our intel sources, low estimate, is 10% of these are terrorists, desensitized, seasoned in fighting in Iraq and uh, Syria. So there you go, Counselor. Well, I think that's absolutely correct. And, and let me tell you what I found out living here in Texas. We have this wide open border, and I've, I've talked to people along the border, and uh, I recently talked to uh, the head of one of the Minutemen group, Minuteman groups here who volunteers basically to assist the Border Patrol. They don't carry weapons. They don't go down there to arrest anybody. They go down there to monitor areas of the border, and to alert the border control when they see uh, people coming across illegally. He says that as of two years ago, 60% of the people crossing the border that were apprehended were what they called OTMs, other than Mexico, which means they were coming from Central America, or but he says they were also coming from Somalia, they were coming from Yemen, they were coming from Iraq, they were coming from Iran. They were coming from other countries where there's a lot of terrorism activity, or support terrorism, coming from Cuba. And he said that at that point, the Border Patrol estimated they were catching one out of every ten possible terrorists coming across the border from these particular countries. Now, the estimate, because of the open border policy, is that they are only apprehending one out of every 100. So we're dealing here not only with these constant these camps being set up, training camps within the country, we're dealing with cells, known cells of ISIS and Al Qaeda that are operating in Texas and other parts of the country. We see it again, people smarter than I am. We're producing an article shortly under John Rama's magazine Magnified View presenting 10 conditions of an imminent terrorist threat to the United States on our homeland, <clears throat> including the terrorist camps, including an unknown number of the little bastards that have gone from here to Syria to fight with ISIS in Syria and Iraq. They are one airplane ride away now without a visa. Many are on American or European passports that don't require visas. So they're one airplane ride away from landing on our home shores again. We work with the Border Patrol, and as you said, their hands have been tied for two years, totally. Now, the poor officers are brave men and women, I sure mean that. They were traditionally the most shot at of any law enforcement agency. Now they're contracting diseases from these contagious diseases we're welcoming across the border, including chickenpox, which we hadn't seen here in a decade. Some friends of ours, acquaintances of ours, humble officers who contracted these diseases, many are afraid to go home at night now, at least they infect their families. Some are staying in hotels till they get a couple days off. Well, like your sons, we're protecting everybody else's border, or we pretend to, but we've totally abandoned our own, haven't we? Absolutely. Well, where did the time go? We're, uh, we're going to wrap up. Uh, Mr. Connolly, uh, what takeaway do our listeners need to hear? Well, just we have to keep up the good fight. And if they want to help us and help the veterans and want to help us with the Constitution fight, they can go to usjf.net to find out how to donate to us. And they can also, veterans can contact me or other people with legal issues involving the Constitution at michael at usjfmail.net. And, you know, we just, we're in it for the the entire effort, uh, with our entire effort to fight for the Constitution, because otherwise we're going to lose our country. Our backpack is off next week to the National 
Association of Broadcasters meeting in Las Vegas. It's really a huge, prestigious meeting of broadcasters. He'll be representing you there, promoting you and your organization. What's your schedule this week? Yours. Uh, this coming, uh, my, this coming yeah. week is pretty, pretty full, unfortunately. Oh, uh, bad. Got, sep- got, sep- got a bunch anyway, of radio shows. Anything we can do for you that you can think of at the last minute. He's honored to be press at a press show, so he'll be representing it. I sure want to talk to you off air, <clears throat> and we want to get you back soon. We want to be all in with you and support you. Our editor-in-chief has said that three times now in an email tonight. So it's been absolutely great, informative having you on, kind sir. Keep on keeping on. We want to get you back soon. Uh, we have one it final question from one of our guests from Phoenix, Arizona. They just want to know, how did you come up with the name Jigsy in your WordPress site? Well, that's actually a uh, server out of uh, Canada. And uh, I wanted to protect my site from being attacked as much as possible uh, was inside this country. So I, I basically set it up out, outside of the country with a corporation up there that uh, handles the website for me. Well, and that's what they they used to be have a, a, a be called Vivity. That was their a call sign. Now it's Jesus. We work closely with Charlie Strange of Extortion Seventeen. Helicopters shoot down in Afghanistan. The ambush. He's bringing a federal suit now with Larry Clayman, advocate. Conservative attorneys proven prima facie, evidentially, that no such agency captured his computer and cell phone. They were taking pictures with it. We're assisting Charlie in that investigation now. We'd like to meet your staff here. We're Oceanside at the gate of Pendleton, so if that's worthwhile and convenient. We can hook up with them here in person. We can knock a coffee shop off its foundation. Well, let me let me contact the CFO uh, who's uh, in charge out there and let him know. I'll give him your contact information. Yeah, we can, we can hook up with them out here. It's been great to have you on. You absolutely well, you love your email. Talk to you again. I think there's a little smoke coming out of my computer with you. <laughs> Yeah. We didn't get a chance to ask him a lot of these questions on the damn email. Yeah. So we better talk him into coming back soon. Yeah, that's right. It's been a great having him on. And uh, <laughs> we're going to take a sh- very short break, and we'll be back. <laughs> Voices of Global Freedom, Magnified View, Patriotic American Hero. Uh, This is Backpack. We want to tell you about a brave American hero, Brigadier General Ernest C. Adino, United States Army, retired, currently serves as Senior Advisor to the Kurdistan National Assembly of Syria. He also serves as Senior Vice President of Radon Corporation. Uh, Check out his blog at generaladino.wordpress.com. Again, General A-U-D. Ino.wordpress.com. Yoda, are we privileged to be working with General Adino? Oh, uh, we we are, <clears throat> we are. The way we're going, we can form a general officer yeah. club here on Voices of Global Freedom. I hope we appropriately bid our guest tonight good night. It was great. I really, I've got three emails from Jan around the editor in chief. We want to go all in with him, right? Yeah, he's one of our. Uh, this is huge audience marks for our show today. I want to reiterate what I said earlier about our Janorama editor-in-chief, founder of the TheMagnifiedView.com. It is our five-year anniversary. You would know that as our editor-at-large. We're just going great with millions of visitors, millions of circulation, far beyond our wildest aspirations. As you know, we're non-monetized. I've learned a slick way of saying 
we don't make any money with it, nor fortunately do we need to. We've got an article coming up, including your terrorist camps in the United States. The article is Imminent Terrorist Threat to Our Homeland, led by ISIS. It includes 10 categories of why we're at a unique, unprecedented threat, including Obama's bringing 500,000 Syrians. Intel authorities reveal that at least 10% of those are sworn terror. Returning little bastards that have left here and gone to fight in Syria and Iraq with ISIS are totally desensitized. They, I don't want to be graphic about what they've learned to do without feeling it and how there are many ways to kill people. They'll be returning to do their ultimate mischief here. Obama's 500,000 here and a couple thousand Syrians. ISIS now penetrating our border. Your backpack's blatant training camps here throughout. How are you doing with that investigation backpack? Where do you think that's going? Well, it continues to unveil um, incredible facts, and we're seeing just uh, the floodgates have been opened um, by Obama. He spent 10 years um, in an ashram, a Muslim training camp himself in Indonesia that we know. Uh, so he's really indoctrinated with the Islamic uh, regime. Uh, our last uh, Phyllis Schlafly really pointed out how much uh, a shock. Uh, she's in her 90s, and she has really talked about the last couple prayer breakfasts that uh, Obama, where he's really against Christianity, which is really a shocker. We just can't believe that would happen. You know, we never could imagine that. Don't mean to blindside your backpack. Do you have the National Anthem Lady song? On your recorder somewhere. Do you have that? Yeah, we're going to have that come up here in a little bit. Love, a, love to play that. Yeah. It, also, do you happen to have IQ Macholi's definition and explanation of Islam somewhere in your bag of tricks computer? There? Gang is on a mission to take the answer. Yeah, we're going to. This weekend, the nation well, started playing. 200 years of the Star Spangled Banner. But tonight, we have the story of a woman who started the celebration a bit early, hitting the road with the intent of performing the national anthem in every corner of this country. Performing our national anthem in all 50 states, from Madison Square Garden to a street corner in Idaho. She's gone wonderful, 50 different states. Janine Stang has sung this song so many times. Janine Stang is back because she has just completed that mission. National Anthem Girl and to represent her in every way we can. Uh, here in a little bit, we're going to play the whole 90-second Star Spangled Banner sang right, and uh, feel free to sing along with National Anthem Girl. She sang from the bridge of the Coast Guard Center. She sang from everything, I think. <laughs> Right. 
Please go check out nationalanthemgirl.org, uh, nationalanthemgirl.org, and it was wonderful to sit down with her and really get to know her and uh, be promoting her and working with her. How long did it take her to get to each and every one of the states? Well, as I said in the interview that we had with her last week, really a total of seven years, and then it dawned on her. She had started doing it in several uh, states, and then she realized, well, I'm going to go for all 50 states, and she is the first person to have ever done this. And it took a total of two years of really focused on, and she's been on Fox and Friends and many other shows to promote her cause of really bringing that song and the importance of how it is. And so many people have died and fought for that song and many other rights and freedoms that we sometimes take for granted. You know from your wanderlust, you're a gypsy vagabond, what it is really to get to all the states. For the audience benefit, it'll soon be up on the magnifiedview.com. Backpack was a IT, information technology, computer programmer, developer, architect, whatever they say they do. He was sitting, designing computer stuff. He prides himself as a quality assurance guy. Programmers and developers need that also. He worked for premier private and public sector corporations and government. Then he got tired of looking at his cubicle, and incredibly, he sold or gave away all his earthly possessions, literally threw them in a backpack. That's where he got his nickname and wandered the country and part of the world. He lived in four-star hotels, and he lived in youth hostels. I don't know if they're youth anymore, but he sure learned a lot about life instead of looking at that cubicle, didn't you, brother? Yeah, it's been an incredible sabbatical, and uh, this month, April, has been the uh, it's the five-year anniversary of MagnifiedView.com. It's also my four-year anniversary of traveling all across the country and meeting a really amazing people to get out. And uh, I really encourage people uh, that I've met to get out there. I've met a lot of people who've spent their entire lives in the same small town. And just there's so many intricate differences in different states from New York City to going to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, California. It's just, there's, it's just so many interesting people. And uh, I spent a great deal of time in Texas, all, so many different states. There's so many stories that I have had a diary called Looking Glass Shattered, Questions and Answers that Heal Old Wounds that comes a lot from these specific experiences. Uh, we do have a caller who just called in, uh, Eric Code 858. Uh, Eric Code 858, if you want to go ahead and say your name and uh, tell us what uh, what you need to tell us. Good afternoon, gentlemen. It's Rich from uh, San Diego. Hi, Rich. How are you? You're a neighbor, Rich. Welcome. Welcome well, to the I, show. I, I understood you guys wanted to chat a little bit about uh, the impending destruction of the Constitution. We do indeed. Well, yeah, we've, please, uh, uh, if, if, I, we if I may, 
tag tag team off of where you left off, backpack. Uh, my son is in the process of going to uh, major national parks in every state in the union with his uh, with his wife and daughter, and uh, he's covered quite a few of them. And it's, oh, that's uh, great! We love it. It's it's his way of getting around. That's and, a good. Uh, we find out. I started with a counter-terrorist unit teaching governments counter-terrorism after the Munich Olympic massacre in the early 70s. We did 110 countries 11 years in 11 years. I took paper money from each country, had some cognac one night, and added them up. What do you do for a crust of bread, Rich? What do you do for a living? Well, the uh, the standard answer I give is as little as possible. But I'm in the uh, I'm in the uh, uh, publishing and uh, and PR business, and I uh, I essentially write, copy, and uh, design segments for radio and TV, and and uh, and help develop our clients and their uh, and their image uh, through the through the content of their expertise. Uh, and I, I, I have to tell you, none of them can sing as well as that young lady. Oh, isn't she? <laughs> Many of our guests that Backpack <clears throat> rounds up are authors. Many others would like to be authors. I'll bet they could benefit from your help. Huh? Well, how can they reach? How can they reach you? Rick? Aside from it being the center post. Of, uh, of expression in the United States allegedly supported by the First Amendment. One of the things that is so important about their writing is that it be effective because it's so competitive now. There's just so very much data out there. So one of the things we do, compliments of my distinctly better half, is we do an annual writer's conference, which is a not-for-profit operation that simply supports itself and this is year 15 coming up, where we teach the art, craft, and business of writing. We were the first of the writers' conferences in the country, and there are 15 or 1,600 of them, to actually have courses that specifically dealt with the business side. And uh, when it was poo-pooed 16 years ago, the uh, the boss said, oh, no, we're going to do this because the business is going to change. And boy, did it ever. Um, with a tenfold increase in the number of books being published in the last five and a half years alone. Um, it's f- more important than ever that people who want to write something be able to understand the business of writing. Otherwise, they might as well be writing it on their restroom wall. <laughs> Is writing for the Internet different than writing a book or writing for press? Well, yes and no. Um your words need to be effective. You need to, in order for that to happen, you need to know who your audience is. And you need to be able to not only reach who you think is going to agree with you, but you need to sort of reach across, I won't use the term aisle, you need to reach across the, across the issues of life to bring in people who don't necessarily think they agree with you or who think that you are of an ilk that they can't agree with you. And perhaps that's the biggest problem with partisan writing and speaking and and PR in general, is that um, everybody sticks to their issues and they're not bringing people across. Yeah, they're, they're reaching across the aisle to make deals, but they're not reaching across to make people understand the critical issues. That's interesting, back back, isn't it? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, so, what made you decide to get a uh, startup PR firm, or what? What did you start doing um, before well, you started working for StrategiesPR.com? dot com? Well, that it's primarily my uh, my better half's company, and she started it as a concept you know, almost two decades ago, and I came in three and a half years ago to handle this end of things as it as the business grew. And so I got into it like we all get into some things by default, uh, and uh, and the business grew on me, and it also gave me an excuse to meet a lot of writers 
and uh, a lot of people in the writing community, which encouraged me to get back into doing some writing. Um, and I've attended all these conferences, both as an attendee and as a uh, you-go-carry-this kind of guy. And uh, And I have to tell you, everybody there, and there's a maximum of 200 attendees, uh, everybody there has 60 or 80 classes to choose from in two and a half days. And they can keep themselves busy from 7 in the morning until 3 in the morning if they choose to do so. Uh, and there will be top people from every field of writing, from top New York Times bestsellers to editors to agents to uh, PR people to people who do writers' websites. Um, every aspect of the writing industry, um, producers and screenwriters and People get to do seven-minute pitches as though they were trying to sell their idea to someone who is on on a uh, on TV. They get to do this to a panel of people, and they have to develop enough of a skin so that they can accept constructive criticism. Because if they don't, and I think we've had two people in 16 years who <laughs> bailed because uh, they felt they were being criticized. Uh, if they don't have that, stay out of the business. You know, go and uh, go and write strictly to entertain yourself, or write a memoir for your kids. But don't ex- commercial viability if you can't um, if you can't take the constructive criticism it takes to meet the competition, because you got plenty of it. So who? Are, well, 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 sir. We're out of a special forces in law enforcement background. <laughs> yes. And, Debriefing everything is a part of our life. We welcome, benefit, and grow and learn from constructive criticism. We have no patience with these guys or girls. If you raise your eyebrow at them, they run in the bathroom with Kleenex for two hours. We don't, <laughs> you must be talking about the people that are running the White House. Oh, indeed. Oh, it truly is, brother. Truly is. Go ahead, Beck. Yeah, we found with law enforcement and military, you know, key ingredient is to be uh, open to training, and it applies exactly what you just said, Richard, about if someone's training resistant and they come to you, you have to drop them like a heavy anchor. You can't do business with someone who is training resistant. Just move on to the next person who's open to the training because there's plenty, um, but, you know, let them go. And I think a lot of people just don't realize that. Well, a lot of that is... You have a predisposition, and this is this is a factor in life. I was sitting down with one of the guys who teaches at the conference, and he's been working with me, kicking me in the tail to to complete an item I've been writing. And he he said, aside from the fact that your writing success is going to be a factor of luck, which is one of the things I'm dealing with in a nonfiction book I'm doing on the. Um, financial survival for writers because my background is also in finance um he said you you've got to understand that there's a lot of luck when you've got you know 10 or 15 million people writing a book and only x number are ever going to get published and even less are ever going to get read but the story that you tell yourself the stories we tell ourselves is we always want to be, and he used an excellent term, we want to be the agent of our own success. Hey, if it worked, I did it. And if it failed, you did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and this is the story in one form or another in, in, in parts of most of our lives that everybody lives in. You know, I made the garden grow, um, I got three great kids. Uh, you know, my dog is well-trained, and, you know, there's a lot of luck in there, and the fact that the dog didn't get rabies and the kids didn't go on drugs and and, 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 um, and the drought didn't kill your plants. You know, there's a lot of factors in there that you're just plain not part of. Um, so this tends to come into reality when you start to write a story, and that story has to be believable to people who are not living in your story you know um one of the problems with that is as you as you start to write and get critical and get criticized you can't watch three quarters of what's on tv because oh that can't happen wait that didn't lead to that accurately or 
there's no correlation between the cause and effect of those events. And granted, they've got to get everything done in 42 minutes for a one-hour show. There still has to be a level of connectivity. And uh, you can see the shows that have been successful year after year after year because they have that. They have good writing. And everything, every speech, every TV show, every radio show, every book, every pamphlet, every debriefing ultimately comes down to the writing how do we express this effectively? How do we get our point across? How do I get you to read this and to comprehend it? Remember the old reading comp- uh, comprehension stuff in school way back when they actually taught that? Yes. Okay. Um, there are so few people who can do that. Everybody is down to 142 words of or 142 characters from a text and... Um, They've got no concept of spelling, grammar, reading comprehension. Um, it's, it's no wonder that, you know, you you watch Waters go out there from Waters World on uh, on the O'Reilly Factor, and he talks to these people, and half of them can't tell, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson from George Jefferson. And, you know, you ask them what the, comp, uh, the, the Constitution is, and they say, well, it's all about our rights. And... Uh, I actually heard one person say he didn't trust the government anymore because he felt the government was taking away his freedoms. Um, and he was he was wearing a some sort of liberal slogan shirt. Um, little did he realize that those liberal slogans were taking away his freedoms. <laughs> but hey, that's a that's another side of this. It's uh it's it's a difficult getting back to the to the business of writing. It is not easy. Um, it takes time. It takes emotional pain, uh, and you, it's something you better understand that you're not going to write it and not have it edited five or six times. So that's part of what people get uh, in that first week in November when they come to the conference. They get a really really good reality check. And lots and lots of opinions on their writing, and lots of ideas to improve it. Well, we're excited about the uh, La Jolla Writers Conference. Who are some of the keynote speakers that you're expecting? Well, we may very well have James Grappando, and if his daughter's health comes back, uh, we had Lorenzo Carcaterra, who wrote most of the Law and Order episodes in the past. He's a terrific writer. Um, I will have to pull up the website to look at some of them, but you've got writers you, writers of women's fiction, uh, writers of uh, nonfiction, uh, all New York Times bestsellers who've been there. James Rollins, uh, Jim Grupando has been there. Do you know uh, Dale Brown? that writes military thrillers. He's ex-Air Force. Steve Berry, Phil Margolin, um, the whole, an enormous cross-section, writers of all genres have been there. John Lescaw that writes uh, uh, legal thrillers. Um, Christopher Reich, who lives here in Encinitas, he writes financial thrillers, and he used to be in banking in Switzerland. And Interesting stuff, because every fiction book is loaded with facts. You can't write a story about, you know, going through Oceanside and describe an intersection if that intersection doesn't exist. Because because someone's going to read that, and that's going to knock your story apart. Well, we want to thank you personally. For a couple of guests that you've brought to us is uh, Lieutenant Randy Sutton. I'm excited great. to meet up with him in Vegas. At, a great guy. We met him at a Starbucks recently, and I, I'm excited to meet up with him as press at the NAB show in Vegas, which is 100,000 people. It's a huge show, and excited to also represent Strategies PR. We got your cards in the mail. So uh, we'll, we're all about cross-promotion and cross-collaboration, helping each other. And also, uh, W. Craig Reed was... Also a huge uh, show. I mean, that one, well, a lot of these shows and uh, personalities we've had, uh, we don't hear on mainstream media. 
and that's what no, Voices of the Global Freedom Radio and Magnified View are about. But those two particular shows with Lieutenant Randy Sutton and W. Craig Reed have been incredible. What types of things have you done working with them, our fine patriots? Well, you know what's interesting is they're both excellent writers, and they've taken the time. And Randy's written a few books, and uh, uh, B.C. Reed's written a few books, and he's he's done two years of research and uh, we were laughing about this a few weeks back uh, when they thought Putin might have been uh, uh, deposed. Uh, he said, oh, goodness, it would be really, really bad for me if, if they if they get rid of Putin because I just spent two years worth of research on a book about him and no one's going to care if he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's that's part of the factor in it. What you don't realize is the amount of research that writers need to do um, to write, e- even if it's fiction. But uh, among what we do with every writer is we help them condense various interesting points of, about their content and their information into segments, anywhere from five minutes to you know an hour and a half. And to get a writer that spent two years doing research and, and a year... At, at their keyboard, putting something on paper, and then had it edited five or six times, uh, and then finally get the thing together and get them to say, okay, you got five minutes. Are you kidding me? How do I talk about this in five minutes? Well, well we're going to take one of your expressions. It takes, it takes 10 years to be an overnight success, and we're <laughs> we're going to run with that. We That's one of our quotes now that we've taken. Uh, so... With W. Craig Reed, I also want to point out Lieutenant Randy Sutton is now the national spokesman for DefendingTheShield.org, and we just recently got off the phone, and he's been busy. He's just really taken to that and how uh, important that organization is to help our police officers and first responders and, you know, really help them and bring uh, justice, you know, in uh, in this today's atmosphere. Well, you know, on that edge of things, it is so important – that you have an organization that isn't just pro, doesn't just say the cop, for example, the cops are always right. Um, In order to be effective, you have to be legitimate. You have to be honest. You have to say we have faults. We do not have standards across the country for police training. We do not have a a national list of who's in law enforcement and who's been thrown out of law enforcement in Podunk, Illinois, when they go to get a job in Sacramento. They don't have that information. This is the kind of lack of information exchange that enabled 9-11 to take place. And this is a, a criticism of the system, and it's something that invites people like Eric Holder to say, well, we need to nationalize all the police, which we need that like we need a poke in the eye. What we need is is to standardize training. We need to affect communication. Um, we need to process rape kits rather than the 90,000 that are laying out there that aren't processed, which means there's tens of thousands of criminals out there harming people. Uh, and we need to we need to effectively get certain things done because we've made mistakes and we need to not keep making those mistakes. That's when you develop credibility. Now you know it's not a perfect thing. It's <laughs> Randy will be the first one to tell you. You're and and what is it? One quarter of one percent of all the people in law enforcement ever use their gun on, on duty, and he's used his in five different shootouts. And he'll be the first one to tell you there is no predictability when guns are uh, guns are blazing. You know, predictability is for Hollywood. Cop. I've I've been a cop brother <laughs> before Randy. I've been shot at a lot. There is no other occupation profession in the world called on to make split second decisions as you are in law enforcement. Not surgeons, not pilots, not firefighters, not book pub. No, nobody is confronted throughout the day in a busy, beat, big city to make a split-second decision. Are you with me, brother? 
Yeah, I want to also add, Yoda and I were at a restaurant recently, and he showed me, he walked about uh, 8 or 11 feet away from me, and he showed within about 1.5 seconds a bad guy will be on me. And uh, I would welcome all the uh, people to do the rounds with a police officer for at least one day, and it'll be a, a huge eye-opening. But just him showing me, he walked about 11 feet away, and it's just seconds that he'd be on me. And that was a huge uh, revelation. You know, what what are your thoughts, Yoda, about that? Yeah, it's an old rule, and if there's two of them, you're in trouble in less than two seconds. It happens sometimes. Right. It really happens. That's that's a good demo. We call it the 20-foot rule, really, with a slow adversary, a slow one. In two seconds, he's trying to stick a knife into you. One, one thousand, two, one. That's two seconds, brother. Wow. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. There's a lot of things about that, but we also uh, have encouraged uh, people who are liberal to do the rounds, and uh, they always refuse to do to go out with a police officer, and they 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 always turn it down. Why do you think that is, Yoda? I think they're stubbornly maintaining their belief. You know, as with Obama, the military's all bad. He's, as did the Clinton military, bad, police bad. Hell, they don't even like firefighters. Anybody military, paramilitary in a uniform. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, Rich, uh, what are your thoughts about the, the these liberals running around? Well, again, you got people who are living in their own stories. Um, and they I, I call them single-issue people. Uh, and what happens is, is you get caught up in a single issue, and you have someone who has sold you on the idea that they are supportive of that issue. And this is guilt on both sides, folks. There's 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 no no party that owns any more or less of this. Uh you get so sold on that issue that they cannot listen to all the other related and ancillary factors that are going to make that issue completely inconsequential. You know, you talk to um uh someone who's gay about why they felt that they needed to vote for Obama, which meant that they didn't pay attention to the fact that his first three and a half years in office he was anti gay. But that notwithstanding, you know, they 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 go with all the good things that he's doing and opening up things. As soon as they get into opening up things with Cuba, it gives me an opportunity to obliterate their position because I ask them about the about the the homosexual work camps that Castro set up that almost nobody knows about, where they work these people to death to make men out of them. You know, they were tantamount to the concentration camps that the Nazis set up, and they still exist while Obama's out there with Raul Castro. Um, and the liberals are going, wow, this is wonderful, peaceful work this guy is doing. Yeah, really? You know, get a look under the hood of that car before you drive it off the lot, folks. They are single issue, and they don't look at the ancillary issue. And that issues, thousands of them. You know, if we don't have a country, you know, we can argue up and back about Roe v. Wade or whatever you want to argue about. But if we don't have a country, we're not arguing about anything. We're not holding this conversation. We're not having talk radio. We're not having open newspapers. And Where do you for- see it going, Russell? Where is it going to be in six months? Where are we going to be in a year? Well, the problem is is that we're all usually pretty comfortable. And, uh, you know, the the worst part of the United States... <laughs> is still better than the best part of a lot of countries. So we just plain don't get it in a lot of in a lot of situations. And Obama was able to organize communities because he had people who were unhappy and he was able to whip them together and organized unhappiness. Go into uh, you know we're in San Diego. Go into uh, La Costa and organize it. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, you know. what do I care about your issue? I'm going to play golf. Yeah, I'm having a problem. I can't get this corner of my lawn to grow. And, oh, wait, I'm going on vacation. You know, 
it's really hard to get these people up in arms over something. But turn around and say, oh, by the way, we're going to cancel your tax deduction for your for your uh, for your property taxes, and that's no longer going to be tax deductible to you. You're going to get those people organized real fast because you're now reaching in their wallet. Um, but if 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 people don't pay attention to the larger picture, we're in deep yogurt. If people get it, if people realize what it means that the national debt is twice what it was, that the country's been credit rating has been downgraded twice under this administration, um, if they don't realize what the Constitution is, for crying out loud, it's six pages. Take the time to read it. It's 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 easier to read than uh, than than the sports page, for crying out loud, with 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 all the stats, and people don't get that. People don't. Our guest, our guest on the show earlier was Michael Connolly with the United States Justice Foundation. He actually has a uh, copy of the Constitution that he's marked up with comments and made it really easy for anybody. And he. It's a product that he has out there. Um, it's been a great show. Um, we have one other caller we're going to take. Uh, Air code 407, if you want to speak your mind. Hey, how are we doing tonight? We're great. Uh, go ahead and please uh, speak your mind. and Welcome, well, to, welcome know, to the show. Well, I, I just oh. think, uh, you know, Americans need to wake up. We need to get involved. And um, we need to take back over uh, the politics because you know it's it's controlled too much by the uh, the top one percent, and it's time for the people to get back in there and and pull down you know pull the curtains and expose the lie you know that, that it's ruling us, and uh, it's time to take back our our towns, our counties, and our states. Good on you, brother. Where do you see us in six months? In As six months? Yeah, or in a year. In six months? A year? Yeah. Well, in a year, we're going to be campaigning for the presidency. You know, yeah. especially a year. Uh, and, you know, it depends on I mean, we've got some decent candidates. I mean, we've got some candidates who are going to fight the Marxist regime. You know, and it's basically we got got uh, crews out there. We got Rand Paul, or not Rand? Yeah, Rand Paul out there. These guys are going to stand up to the Marxist regime. You know, they're going to try to battle the IRS and try to battle the Federal Reserve and audit the Federal Reserve. Can it happen? I don't know. I mean, these guys, you know, you, you know, the Marxists are pretty strong in this country right now. Are they you know, ever? Yeah. Who and, do and you so far? What's that? Early in the game. <laughs> Early in the game, but who do you like well, so you know, far? I do like that Cruz actually came and said he wanted to get rid of the IRS. That is a beautiful thing, you know. I mean, and um, you know, but then Rand Paul wants to audit the Fed, and there's been quite a few numbers that audit the Fed in there. And you got to realize that the uh, two main planks of the Communist Manifesto that Marx wrote was basically, you know, hey, let's, you know have an, a graduated income tax, and let's have a deep centralized banking system and then excessive property taxes and, and of course, anti-religion. You know, he thought the uh, religion was the opiate of the masses. And, you know, he saw it in what happened in Russia, in the Soviet Union, in China, and Pol Pot, all those guys that uh, followed the Marxist drums and what's going on in Venezuela now and Cuba and, you know, and, North Korea. I mean, we don't want tyranny, man. <laughs> that's, that's the bottom line. We do not want tyranny, and it's up to the people to stand up and uh, take back our country. In my opinion, they will. I think guys like you are working hard, you know, working harder than ever now, scratching out a living, everybody I know. I think when it gets bad enough that you, 23 million veterans, a whole bunch of cops, fire others, will stand up, do you? Yeah, I would hope they would. You know, I mean, it's, uh, 
Uh, although I think we're going to head towards, uh, I think by 2020, we're going to see WW3. And, you know, that could uh, put things back in the hands of the Marxists pretty strong. And who knows which way and who's going to win that. Um, it's going to be a pretty, you know, his history kind of repeats itself in patterns. I can definitely see that happening. Um, you know, it's like, and there's some big players out there. You know, I mean, China can get involved, Russia can get involved, Iran, all, you know, every, everybody in the Middle East again, just like it was. You know, World War One uh, destroyed the Ottoman Empire. World War Two, um, you know, basically gave birth to Israel, and Israel's uh, our 51st and most important state. And you know, it's most like us in the Middle East, but it's almost like the Crusades, if you go back a thousand years before that, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, the first Crusades was very successful and we held on to Israel for almost a hundred years before Saladin came along and, and started the caliphate again. So I think, you know, history goes in patterns. I can see it happening again. I can see, you know, a battle in the Middle East that, you know, everybody gets behind it. It's already brewing up. I no, I, I definitely think we might see that by 2020. I've got to agree with you. I've, I've been in a lot of wars that didn't have names, <laughs> all kind of wars. Many of them start by accident. So with the volatility today of the Middle East, my word, the Arab Spring sure went to Arab winter. I readily see some 20-year-old on either side of it hitting the button now. Back in the day, you had to load up a musket, you know, to start something. Today, some kid on a naval vessel or in an airplane or wherever, all he has to do is get scared and hit the button. Good call, brother. We hope you stay with us. Yeah, great call. Welcome, and thank you. Thank you for calling in. Uh, When you get a chance to... you can feel free to check out magnifyview.com and contact us through that. And uh, Voices of Global Freedom Radio, it's been great having you on the show. Hey, nice talking to you guys too, man. Keep up the good work. Later. Thank call you. Back. Yeah, please call back. Thank you, sir. We're back with uh, Richard. Uh, so, Richard, you know, the subject of the show today was about Obama's destroying the Constitution. You know, what are your thoughts about how much the Constitution has been destroyed and, you know, where where everything's going with that? Well, the the thing that people need to do is they need to understand that this document runs the show. It was originally designed as a mechanism that idiots could operate so long as they followed it. You know, if if you have three different sets of powers counterbalancing each other, it almost doesn't matter how bad any one or two of them are because it'll all balance out and things are going to change over. The problem is, is this excuse for an administration is, I clean that up, uh, is overstepping. And it's, well, I can do whatever I want. I'm president of the United States. He said that. He said, well, I have a cell phone and a pen. Well, you know, uh, it's going to take us a long time to clean up the mess when he's gone. But I don't think he's done yet. I think he's going to do some amazingly stupid things uh, that are really going to push the envelope, if not tear up the envelope, or do his darndest to do so between now and then, because he considers the Constitution an antiquated document. And um, it's probably the most fantastic political mechanism ever written by man. Um, and if you go through it, it, it is clearly something that was written by people who were selfless. Yeah, they had their own interest, and they were successful people, and they were capitalists, and they believed in, in, in a higher power, and, um, and they had their own biases, and they weren't perfect. I mean, for crying out loud, everybody keeps picking on Jefferson, who wrote the document, because he owned slaves. Well, so did everybody else then. And it was stupid and it was wrong, but in the context of history, it was what it was. Um, And we're hundreds of years later, folks. We don't have slaves. We don't enable slaves. We don't condone slavery. 
And there's more slavery going around around the rest of the world right now than we ever had here at our worst. Um, so if people don't tension, if people don't understand the mechanism, if they don't take a moment to say, hey, wait a minute, the first three words of this document say it all. We the people. If we don't pay attention to that, he can destroy it. As long as we pay attention to that, as long as we remind him that, hey, you know what? We're living by the Second Amendment, folks. There's only so far you're going to go. And that's one of the reasons that he's against it. So what's going to happen? It's going to be up to the people. Uh, am I scared? Every day i got grandkids. Uh, am I hopeful? Every minute. Um, what's what the term? Praise think, brother, what do you think, leaping ahead, and we do this with all the guests, we're not just putting your little tootsie to the fire, what do you what? think his intentions on creating martial law here? Oh, I think the first opportunity he has, he would do it. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you destroy the police forces, he's already t- he's already turning around and working his way up that ladder. He, he he puts the National Guard in place to do the work that should be done by the Ferguson police instead of turning around and saying, you know, these are the police. And, and instead of the Attorney General coming out and saying, you know, we went through every single step of the law, and this guy got shot legitimately. Now, go back to your houses and stop running things down, and if there's bad guys out there running around, get out of the way so we can get the bad guys. He didn't say that. He said, well, you know, I sort of understand with your culture. and Don't give me that crap. If you're the <laughs> chief law enforcement officer, enforce the law. And part there's of that a, is don't interfere with the law. You know, you don't want to get shot by a cop, don't attack one. There's a $99 million facility in Georgia, and they're running elements of DHS through riot control and citizen confinement. This is easily available in research. So they're taking elements of the Secret Service, Coast Guard, on and on and on, running them through there. The idea is to replace the local police in the event of martial law. They know the local copper that teaches your kids soccer is not going to shoot civilians. But they train these remotely, then they drop them a thousand miles away. The idea is to enforce martial law really well. People smarter than I am see it coming, really. Our insiders that are indeed Insider, insiders see it coming. So well, I well, the first not. the first excuse he has, he will do it. We have to not yeah. give him an excuse, and we have to and we have to make everybody realize that you know, yeah, you know, fifty fifty million people put you in office, and sixty million people are gun owners. I've lived under martial law. And- several numerous countries. Can't be and fun. It's not what, yeah, it's not what people here think it is at all. You know. They think it won't affect them individually. Yeah. Certainly it does. Well this Which is again people being ignorant. On, yeah, Richard, we got one last question from Seattle, Washington. They want to know why aren't the feminists all up in arms about this whole uh, Sharia law that's actually starting to take place in Irving, Texas? Uh, Dearborn, Michigan, and many places across the United States. Why, why don't the feminists speak uh, against uh, the horrors of Sharia law and how horrible it treats women? What are your thoughts well, on that? It's PR. It is easier to sell the idea of equal pay to women than it is to sell the idea of go process the rape kits. It's easier to sell the idea you have to protect Roe v. Wade than it is to turn around and say, hey, how would you like it if you had forced castration and you got to walk with you know, a, a hood over your head ten steps behind your husband? And if you wore a dress, you were referred to as a prostitute. Uh, it's an easy 
sell. It's the standard example of people not paying attention to the entire. Um, why don't they do that? You know, why has smoking increased among women? Right. Uh, you know, it, it's and it's not because women are stupid. But when has intelligent ever protected people from doing something stupid? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's it's not insulation. If if intelligence were going to do that, well, then a lot of intelligent people would not have voted for Barack Obama. Twice, twice, twice. At least not the second time. Yeah. And that the fact of the matter is, is is that people vote with emotion. And you got to get a little bit below that surface. You got to get them to go, "Hey, wait a minute. What's the rest of the story? Or what's part of the rest of the story? Or what's a secondary consequence, much less a tertiary or a quaternary consequence, of this regulation?" I got a dear friend who's who's a writer. He's a good writer. They've been our friends for a couple of decades. We're out to breakfast with him for the first time in many months because they're dyed in wool Democrats. And I'm sitting there, and I'm hoping we don't get into a political conversation because it impedes my digestion. And, and and his wife's in the in the medical field, and she was talking about this massive problem that they were having because of uh, Obamacare. And I just looked at her, and I glanced at her husband, and I got a half a smile on my face, and I said, "Wow, you think anybody read that before they voted for it?" And then I changed the subject. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and and all of a sudden she was getting it because it fell in her yard. Oh yeah. And you got to tell people what's going to happen in their yard. They got to listen, and that's where this whole communication thing comes in. That's where this whole make your words effective thing comes in. If you got something to say, you got to make it so people listen. And uh, well, Richard, we've got about twenty seconds left. Do you want to go ahead and tell the audience how they can reach you? It'd be great. Be if anybody wants to know anything about the art, craft, and business of writing, from new author to New York Times bestseller, LaHoyaWritersConference dot com. We welcome people of all levels, of all political persuasions, and of all subject matter. I mean, that's what uh, that's what writing is all about, and uh, and it's inexpensive if you take a look online at www.lahoyawritersconference.com. I think the early bird special is still in place. And if you do a little arithmetic, you'll figure out really quickly that with what's taking place in that weekend, we're certainly not making money on it. <laughs> well, thank you, Richard, for being on the show. Go check out strategiespr.com. We're sure, winding up the show you. for today. So it's been a pleasure having you on. Thank You're you so much. You're a good friend, Richard. We want to know you a long time. Give well, our fund. Best to Antoinette, would you? Yeah, thank you. I, I will do that over dinner tonight. All, All right. Take care, Have gentlemen. a great night. All right. Take care. Be safe. Bye now. So uh, we're excited to uh, getting ready for the uh, National Association Broadcaster Show. It's a really uh, incredible event. And we want to also say hello to LeadingEdgeRadioNetwork.com. Please go check that out. We're honored, privileged to be running on that network. And we're on Drive by Time uh, with Ricky Robinson, the Spark Radio Network, and K98. Uh, we just got a minute left, but we are excited about being press at the National Association of Broadcasters. Wish you the best of luck over there, Backpack. Sorry I have to hang out here guarding the fort. So have the best of time over there, brother. Well, thank you. We're excited, and uh, we'll be following up with uh, exclusive shows from the floor, uh, National Association of Broadcasters. Thank you. Have a great night. God bless. Uh-huh.